Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, June 13th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very, very busy weekend. I taught my online class on um, Saturday. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And our guest speaker was Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. So we had a fantastic class. If uh, you missed that class, you can still register for the uh, for the online course. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com will also post a link here as well. So we had a really good conversation with Dr. David M. Hotep, and he talked about his new book, which will be out in two to three weeks, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. All right, so uh, on today's show, we're going to uh, continue our conversation dealing with critical race theory, continue our conversation dealing with African-American farmers as well. Um, Thursday, I think it was Thursday, uh, this came out June 10th. Yeah, Thursday, June 10th. Um, the Florida Board of Education, Florida State Board of Education, passed a rule banning critical race theory from being taught in classrooms. OK, now, critical race theory is not taught in K through 12. Uh, and this is an attack once again on uh, teaching a uh, real history and dealing with systemic racism and dealing with how laws and policies are used to oppress uh, African-Americans and uh, non-white people. There's a concerted effort to fight against this. This is a concerted effort to uh, there's an attack on the 1619 project that we continue to see. So uh, this took place in Florida. Several groups, including the state teachers union, opposed the rule change, saying it would do greater. Uh, it would do a greater disservice to students to cover up history. It would do a greater disservice to students to cover up history. You had teachers saying, let us teach the truth. Let us teach the truth. Uh, allow teachers to teach the truth. That was the actual quote, allow teachers to teach the truth. So this took place in Florida where you have Governor Ron DeSantis uh, as governor. And then um, we know also Thursday night, uh, a judge in Wisconsin, a judge in Wisconsin uh, put a pause on the $4 billion loan forgiveness uh, program that was part of the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. And this loan forgiveness program is for African-American farmers, is for farmers of color, non-white farmers, to address decades of discrimination and racism by the federal government and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, especially towards African-American farmers. Well, this loan forgiveness program has been paused because you have white farmers who were suing saying that they're excluded from the program, they're crying racism. Imagine that, white farmers crying racism. Now, white, these white farmers were silent in 2020 when they got almost $26 billion from the Trump administration, okay, and COVID-19 relief aid. They got almost $26 billion. African-American farmers got one-tenth of 1%, one they got $20.8 million. These white farmers that are crying discrimination now weren't saying discrimination back then. So we talked about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered, and I shared this on, a, on my Friday shows on Roland Martin Unfiltered, um, Friday, June 11th. I'm a panelist each Friday on the show. Uh, we're going to revisit that clip. We're going to share that again. There's an, uh, also an article from the Washington Post that came out June 11th. Uh, it came out Friday, June 11th. Then I'm going to reference as well. Judge halts billions in debt relief for farmers of color as conservative group for white farmers sue. OK, they're suing the Biden administration. OK, they're suing, uh, claiming uh, discrimination. Now, when they were getting all the benefits, OK, and uh, when African-American farmers were excluded for decades or being discriminated against for decades from aid from the federal government, these white farmers were silent. So we'll talk about that story. And then um, June 12th, June 12th was the anniversary of the assassination 
of uh, Megger Evers, civil rights activist Megger Evers. He was assassinated June 12, 1963, outside of his home, shot in the back by a white supremacist uh, named Byron Della Beckwith. Okay, Byron Della Beckwith, who was a member of the White Citizens Council. Uh, we're going to talk some about uh, Megger Evers and his legacy. Uh, a lot of times when, they, when we talk about civil rights activists, and merely Evers Williams, his, his widow, has said this. A lot of times when we talk about civil rights activists, M Megger Evers gets left out of that conversation. We'll talk about the, uh, Dr. King. We'll talk about Malcolm X. We'll talk about Rap Ralph Abernathy, Jesse Jackson. OK, um, Reverend C.T. Vivian, John Lewis, which we should. All the above, we should. And, and Septima Clark and, 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 and Rosa Parks and, and Fannie Lou Hamer. But when we have this conversation, oftentimes Megger Evers gets left out of the conversation. We know Megger Evers was only 37 years old when he was assassinated. He was the first field secretary in the South for the NAACP. He was organizing in, in Mississippi, especially Jackson, Mississippi, uh, organizing for desegregation and uh, registering African-Americans to vote. So we'll, we'll talk some about the legacy of Megger Evers also. And then we know Juneteenth is coming up. Uh, Juneteenth is uh, Saturday, June 19th. So we'll deal with a little history dealing with Juneteenth. What is Juneteenth? And Juneteenth is Emancipation Day, not Independence Day. Because I see some people saying well, Juneteenth is our Independence Day. OK, I, I, I can understand you saying that um, in July 4th, 1776, um, majority of African-Americans, you know, were, were enslaved. I, I can understand that. But June, uh, but Juneteenth is an Emancipation Day, but it's not Independence Day because we weren't independent. They, we were we were freed, but we were not given the tools that are needed to stay free. We were not given reparations. We were not given land in general. The majority of the four million uh, former slaves were not given land. Yes, you had uh, special field order number 15, which is commonly known as 40 acres and a mule, but that would only apply to coastal land in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. That only applied to coastal land in South Carolina, Florida and Florida and Georgia that was broke. That was uh, divided up uh, by about 40,000 uh, African-American families. OK, so the majority of us did not get uh, land. All right. So we'll, we'll deal with some of the history of, uh, of Juneteenth and what's behind it. And speaking of Juneteenth, I will be in Atlanta. Uh, June 18th through the 20th for the. Uh, ninth annual Juneteenth Festival. The ninth annual Juneteenth Festival um, is taking place at uh, Centennial Park, uh, Olympic Centennial Park. Visit JuneteenthATL.com for more information. JuneteenthATL.com for more information. Centennial Olympic Park. This is free, open to the public, good family event. So I'll be there all three days. I'll have a vendor booth. So come check me out in my vendor booth. And I'll be speaking on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, in the amphitheater, uh, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. both days, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. both days. OK, so visit JuneteenthATL.com. Arrested Development is performing. Uh, I think Angel performing this year as well. They have music. This is the uh, the Juneteenth Atlanta Parade and Music Festival. OK, uh, so it's, it starts Friday, June 18th, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. The parade is on Saturday. Um, usually it's either, either I think it's at noon. The parade starts. Check the website for uh, proper times. And yeah, parade starts at noon on Auburn Avenue. OK, uh, so come. So come check this out. They usually have about 100 to 130 African-American vendors and Caribbean vendors and African vendors and African History Network will be there as well. All right. I have my DVD lectures there, et cetera. OK. So we're going to deal with that uh, on today's show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions. Because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. 
Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, if you want to support the African History Network, we definitely need your support because, uh, I, you know, this this helps me get to and from uh, Atlanta. Uh, even though I'm speaking there, I still have expenses to cover. So this definitely helps. Uh, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So when you do it through Cash App, you've heard me say this before, you've seen me show the graphic recently. Uh, be sure to type in dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W, unless you click on uh, the link that I just posted here. And you see the graphic here on the screen. Uh, this is the, the official uh, African History Network Cash App account. Our tag is dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. And it shows my name there, Michael, shows my picture. These other two are fake African History Network Cash App accounts that I don't know who set these up. I already already reported them to Cash App, but they've been stealing money from us. These are not mine. I don't know who did this. I'm trying to find out. But ours is dollar sign the AHN show SHOW. So this is just so you know if you sent if you sent money to the fake uh, uh, African History Network Cash App accounts, you go through the, the app, uh, click on problem with payment, go through the app. And you can uh, uh, let them know that you send it to the wrong account and ask them to uh, send the money back. OK, and, and explain the situation, because I've had people they've done that uh, for them. That's how I found out that somebody set up these fake accounts. Uh, somebody told me, hey, I sent money. Did you get it? I said, no, let me check. And then I go in. I said, would you send it? And they showed me. I'm like, uh, that's not me. But anyway. All right. So I want to jump into this uh, topic here dealing with. Uh, Critical race theory. Now, we've been talking about critical race theory here uh, very frequently. And this ties into history. If you heard this, if you heard the show that I did Thursday, where we dealt with the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890 and how the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890 legalized poll taxes and literacy tests. OK, and this is before the grandfather clause was instituted in 1898. This is before Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. And they actually said uh, at the at the convention, the Mississippi State Convention. Now, there's a really good article from um, Washington Post on this called the Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. We came here to exclude the Negro. If you didn't, if you didn't see our show from uh, June 10th, 2021, go back and watch it. We have them archived here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. If you missed that, that, missed that show, go watch it. It's also an audio podcast format. Uh, we're on nine different audio podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, CastBox, ACAS, FM Player. But uh, download the iHeartRadio app, search for the African History Network show, they have about, uh, I think, 300 of my podcasts there. And also search for 910 AM, the Superstation, uh, WFDF in Detroit. Search for 910 AM, the Superstation uh, in Detroit on iHeartRadio. You can listen to all of these shows live, okay? All right, so uh, I talked about this on our show Thursday, June 10th, the Mississippi plan. And, and they actually said, we came here to exclude the Negro. This was... Uh, uh, the convention president, the convention president in Mississippi in 1890, when they're voting on the state constitution, uh, the convention's president was Sol uh, Solomon Saladin Calhoun. He was a white county judge and he put the voting issue bluntly. He said, quote, let's tell the truth. If it bursts the bottom of the universe, he said, we came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. We came here to exclude the Negro. So then they passed the Mississippi State Constitution that instituted uh, poll taxes and literacy tests and put obstacles in the way of 
uh, African Americans voting, obstacles in the way of the 15th Amendment of 1870. Delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and poll tax gear to suppress the black vote in a state with a black majority. The Mississippi Plan, as it was called, the Mississippi Plan became the model throughout the South, part of a raft of, ra of racially oppressive Jim Crow laws that ended Reconstruction. We know in Reconstruction ends in 1877 with the Compromise of 1877. Well, what we see here today is we see we see laws being used to suppress correct history being taught in schools. We see laws being used to suppress correct history being taught in schools. And the people who are passing the laws are grossly, largely in general, grossly ignorant of history. And then they and then by suppressing this history, not teaching the proper history in, this, in school, you are then controlling the trajectory of the future. Whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. And as uh, Dr. Carol Anderson said on All In With Chris Hayes on, uh, I think that was on Thursday, uh, last Thursday, June 10th, she said, you have bad policies that are being passed based upon bad history. We're going to deal with all this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future radio, the oldest radio station in, in town. Um, call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a quick question or comment. So right before the break, I was talking about um, what's taking place in um, – but what took place in Florida with the um, pass with the Florida Board of Education, the state board passing a uh, policy banning critical race theory. OK. And then. OK. So just so I was talking during the break and people asking. And, and so Sharon asked this question. You're not getting paid to speak in Atlanta. No, I'm not getting paid to speak in Atlanta. OK. <laughs> I'm getting free just so people understand. No, I'm no, I'm not. I'm getting they, they cover me on the booth. No, I'm not getting paid to speak in Atlanta. OK. Those are my people, but I ain't no. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I don't know why people thought. OK, it, whatever. <laughs> it is what it is. But <laughs> I do is a lot of stuff I do for free and I got to cover calls out of my pocket. So I, it's just a lot of things I, I don't talk about, you know, but it, it just be there's a lot of things I do for free. But anyway. Um. So this took place in Florida. Now, Florida is like the 20th state to pass some type of laws, policies dealing with critical race theory and also attacking the 1619 project. And as somebody who's a historian, I see these attacks coming a mile away. These are dangerous. These are dangerous. We're going to go to clip one, Jalen. Um, Florida, this is from abcnews.com. abcnews.com had a, had a really good segment dealing with this. Um, Florida bans critical race theory in public schools. Okay, let's go to this clip, Jalen. A closer look at controversial academic movement. The critical race theory movement in the headlines as Florida becomes the latest state to ban schools from teaching about systemic racism. ABC's Zachary Keish is here with more. Good morning to you, Zachary. Eva, good morning to you as well. You know, it's really a way of looking at the world. It's a lens that acknowledges the role that racism plays. But critics will argue because it's both complex and because it's been politicized, instead of being used as a way of reexamining or reframing the past, it's being used as a tool to accentuate a cultural divide. This morning, critical race theory, a term originally used to broaden how we think about the past, is being used by some to define the racial divide in our schools. Critical race theory comes out of the legal field. It's been conceptualized over 40 years ago by scholars such as Kimberly Crenshaw, speaking specifically about how systemic racism works in the legal field. These legal scholars argued individual intentions can't be proven, but as a framework, racism is baked into our social systems and psychology. That's the start of the conversation, they said. Last year, the New York Times 1619 Project placed the struggle of black Americans at the center of our country's narrative. 
While the work gave a nod to those largely left out of the history books, it quickly became politicized. Critical race theory was the umbrella term. This is a deliberate plan to politicize and whitewash history. Thank you, Mr. Frey. Stop it. It is sad that we are even contemplating something like critical race theory, where children will be separated by their skin color and deemed permanently oppressors or oppressed in 2021. On Thursday, the Florida Board of Education banned critical race theory in its schools. I think it'll cause people to think of themselves more as a member of a particular race or based on skin color uh, rather than based on the content of their character. There's no national mandate saying this Hey, hey Jalen, pa- pause it right there for a minute. Pause it right there, Jalen. Just back it up about 10 to 20 seconds, man. Okay, so let, let me explain something to you all. Now, that, that was Governor Ron DeSantis, okay? Governor Ron DeSantis, who who was on uh, Fox News, the town hall meeting they had in Fox News. So when, when President Joe Biden gave his um, joint, gave his address to a joint session of Congress on um, uh, Wednesday, August 27th, then, and, and, you know, and then uh, T- Senator Tim Scott, who's the Isaiah T. Montgomery, of today, if you saw my show Thursday, if you saw Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, June 11th, you know I talked about Isaiah T. Montgomery because Isaiah T. Montgomery was the only African American in the uh, Mississippi state legislature, okay? And he voted along with the white supremacists to institute, he voted to approve the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890, which instituted the poll taxes and literacy tests discriminating against his own people. Isaiah T. Montgomery was the was the mayor. Uh, he, he founded the town of Bayou, uh, Mississippi. OK, he was the founder and mayor of Bayou, Mississippi, and he was in the state legislature. Isaiah T. Montgomery. Senator Tim Scott is the Isaiah T. Montgomery of today. Because Senator Tim Scott is going along with these voter suppression laws that he knows are targeting African-Americans. And then he went and then on 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 Sunday, May 2nd, Senator Tim Scott was on Face the Nation attacking the four billion dollars in loan forgiveness for African-American farmers and farmers of color. That that part of the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan was put in there by Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia and Senator Cory Booker of of New Jersey. Senator Tim Scott who has 6,000 African-American farmers in South Carolina, where he's the the junior senator of, and he's not doing anything for for them. He attacks this policy that that will help African-American farmers. So if you, uh, so we just heard Ron DeSantis, who when he was on Fox News, the day, so the day after Biden gives a speech, that Thursday, Fox News has a, a uh, town hall meeting asking is is America a racist country? So, uh, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, who who beat Andrew Gillum in the 2018 gu- gubernatorial race, you see this is an example of how elections have consequences. Okay, Governor Ron DeSantis says systemic racism doesn't exist. Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican, who's a big Trump supporter, said on Fox News systemic racism doesn't exist. Now you just heard him say he just talked about. Uh, judging people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. They misquote Dr. King. So, so they misquote Dr. King from, from the speech renamed I Have a Dream from, from 1963, uh, okay? August 28th, 1963. The original name of the speech was called Normalcy Never Again. Normalcy Never Again. The speech was renamed a canceled check. It's it's called I Have a Dream Later. That's not the original name of the speech. If you actually read the text of the speech, you can go to LOC.gov, Library of Congress website. If you actually read the entire speech, Dr. King is talking about dismantling white supremacy and racism. He's talking about calling America, he's calling America out on their hypocrisy. He says that we were given a, a promissory note a hundred years prior in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. And then when we take the promissory note to the bank, it's marked insufficient funds. He calls out police brutality. He calls out segregation, Jim Crow laws, uh, poverty, all of this in the speech. 
The speech is not about a dream. When you read Clarence B. Jones, uh, who was running Dr. King's speech writers, Clarence B. Jones wrote an article for the Washington Post dealing with the uh, speech renamed I Have a Dream. Dealing with the speech renamed I Have a Dream. He says the phrase I Have a Dream didn't appear in, in the original drafts of the speech because the speech wasn't about a dream. So what people like Governor Ron DeSantis, who Andrew Gillum said at, at, a, at, a, at a gubernatorial debate, he said, I'm not saying uh, Mr. DeSantis is a racist. I'm saying the racists believe Mr. DeSantis is a racist. What they do is they skip over Dr. King's critique of racism in America in the very same speech. And they go to black children and white children holding hands and the content of their character. But that's after you dismantle white supremacy that they don't want to acknowledge exists. This is why the correct history has to be taught. Because you can't have people ignorant of history who are empowered to write laws that impact everybody. So let, let's go back to that clip, uh, uh, Jalen. Where children will be separated by their skin color and deemed permanently oppressors or oppressed in 2021. On Thursday, the Florida Board of Education banned critical race theory in its schools. I think it'll cause people to think of themselves more as a member of uh, a particular race or based on skin color uh, rather than based on the content of their character. There's no national mandate saying this curriculum needs to be taught in public schools. But at least five Republican-led states have now officially banned the theory from public education. Last month, state AGs from 20 states told the Education Department they oppose the teaching. Well, what teachers have been doing is simply doing what they always do. They create magic in our classrooms. They give our students the opportunity to understand the full breadth and depth of the American society. And that is uh, about the inception of this country. That's about our Constitution. That's about slavery. That's about Jim Crow laws. It's about the beautiful inventions that we've had. And it spans across the di diaspora. And it spans across any demographic kind of uh, uh, divide that we may have. People on both sides are fired up. It absolutely needs to be taught, okay? CRT needs to be taught to avoid biases, you know? So not repeat history. There are races. There always has been. Um, they should be condemned. But I don't believe that America is a racist country. Now, some say that education has been impacted by the moment. We're unfortunately seeing resistance to even broach the concept of what that means in our understanding of our history and our present. Not a new concept, some four decades in the making. Now, some educators argue that the controversy is manufactured and not reflective of any wholesale changes across education. With all right, Zachary Keish for us. Thank you. Okay, pause right there. All right, thanks, Jalen. Okay, so you you heard the uh the one guy who said there are racist people, but he doesn't think America is a racist country. All right. Whether America is a see to say America is a racist country or not is really it, it that's that's really ambiguous. That's really nebulous. What are you calling America? Are you calling the government the governmental institutions America? Are you calling the Constitution America? Are you saying the founding fathers? Are you saying the 330 million people who exist today? What are you calling America? When we look at critical race theory, see, see, so so when you start trying to, you can't, first of all, let's do this. You have to define what racism is. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. This is what racism is. Racism is not on an individual basis. Racism is not not liking people because of their race, not calling people racial epithets. That's bigotry. Racism is something different. Racism is a power structure. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race that comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, media, health care, marketing, etc., and they use this to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. This is racism. Some people refer to that as systemic racism. But if you actually understand racism, racism is systemic by nature. It's not an individual to individual relationship. Racism is a group to group relationship. So when you 
want to boil it down to individuals and you want to talk about there are individuals who are racist this ain't about individuals this is about a system of white supremacy and racism this is the conversation that a lot of white people don't want to have not all white people many of them do they, they want to have this conversation some some get it others don't now some white people started learning more about it in summer 2020 with the protests taking place the black lives matter protest george floyd all this stuff some people started some white people started learning more about how their white privilege protects them so when you try to boil this down to individuals that means you don't even understand what racism is because racism is a is a system and and it's a group and, and racism is a group is a group sport it's a team sport it's not on an individual basis so if we look at this uh, article here, this is from uh, Black News Channel. And this shows you, gives you a basic understanding of critical race theory. They go on further in the article to talk about it. Uh, this is when uh, former state representative um, uh, Vernon Jones got his behind handed to him by Dr. Mark Lamont Hill on the Black News Channel. Because state representative Vernon Jones and you, and you get you got you have a lot of these black conservatives. I'm neither Republican or Democrat, but I sure as hell ain't stupid. One, I'm a historian. Two, I study these policies. Okay, I study these policies and 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 and, um, and, and, and these bills and things like this. So, State Representative Vernon Jones is running for governor of Georgia. Now, he used to be a Democrat. He switched to the Republican Party, and he's a big Trump supporter. Okay, already you know he's brain damaged. He goes on. Uh, he, he, he says that if he becomes governor of Georgia, the first one, of the first things he's going to do is sign an executive order banning critical race theory. But when he was asked numerous times by Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, explain to me, explain to me what critical race theory is. Vernon Jones couldn't explain what critical race theory is. M most of these most of these conservatives. Republicans, conservatives, whatever you want to call them, most of them who are attacking critical race theory can't tell you coherently what it is. So it just becomes a trick bag just to throw everything in it that they don't like about race and call it critical race theory. But critical race theory is a legal analysis on the premise that race is a social construct, a social construct, not something that's biological because because the only race is the human race. You have to deal. you understand the evolution of the, the concept of race and humanity being stratified into races. Uh, and we see this evolve over the 16th, 17th, or 18th centuries. You have people like uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Carl von Linnaeus, uh, who stratifies humanity into races. And then you have uh, Dr. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach um, in 1779, who coins the term Caucasian. And he stratifies humanity into races as well. And they start, they start associating um, characteristics uh, and oftentimes negative characteristics, they start associating this with race. It's not something scientific, okay? It's, 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 it's not something scientific, all right? So you have to understand the stratification of humanity by races. Um, in Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGru, she talks about this, okay? And we see this evolution in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. So critical race theory is not about making white people feel guilty it's not about making white children feel guilty or separating people based upon uh oppressor and oppressed and all this stuff and if you if you watch this clip here from uh abcnews.com and we're gonna uh post a clip here it, at, at one of the meetings that they have where people uh are expressing whether they're for or against critical race theory you hear this sister her name is keisha she's up here i don't know where she got her information about critical race theory but it's wrong. She said it's going to separate children based upon oppressed and oppressor and all this nonsense. Uh, and she probably voted for Donald Trump. She's brain damaged. But critical race theory is a legal analysis on the premise that race is a social construct that is used to oppress people of uh, oppress people of color rather than a natural biological feature. Now it goes on to say, if we uh, scroll down in the article, um, critical race theory. Theory is okay. Critical race theorists hold that the law and legal institutions in the United States are inherently racist insofar as they function to create and maintain 
social, economic, and political inequalities between whites and non-whites, especially African-Americans. Now that's coming from Britannica.com. The people who attack critical race theory don't want to talk about how the laws and policies have been used to oppress African-Americans and non-white people and maldistribute wealth, power, and resources into the hands of white people. They don't want, they see, I've said before, a magician usually doesn't show you how he or she does the trick. A magician usually doesn't teach you how they do the trick because if they teach you how to do the trick, then you're not going to pay to come see their show anymore. Uh, uh, David Blaine, David Copperfield, whoever the top magicians are, you know, there's a, there's a joke in there. There's a, uh, I heard a joke about uh, Magic City. They, in Atlanta, they call it Magic City because the women there make your money disappear. There is a joke there, but we ain't going <laughs> to go there, right? <laughs> Jalen's probably laughing right now. <laughs> Jalen's back at the studio, right? <laughs> Okay, so you know, I never been to Magic City. I just drove by there, I passed by there sometimes when I was in, in uh, Atlanta. But anyway, so the, the the magician never shows you how they do their magic trick. When you start teaching this history of how laws and policies have maldistributed wealth, power, and resources into the <laughs> when you start when you start teaching this history of what happened. And how we got to this place now, the, now you exposing the magician's tricks. Now the magician can't do these tricks anymore. That's why they're so against critical race theory. This is not trying to make people feel guilty, or anything like that. This is about dealing with the truth. And they can't, many of them can't handle the truth. Not all white people. I'm not saying all white people. Many of them, many of them, many of them in the Republican Party and even some in the Democratic Party. Maybe some independents. Many of them can't handle the truth. All right. I, I want so if we look at this, uh, if we go back and look at this one here from uh, Black News Channel, blacknewschannel.com. Um, Republican led states such as Tennessee and Iowa have proposed and passed bills that ban the teaching of critical race theory at public universities with legislators saying it's un American. Okay. Uh, so read this. Check out this one here. And Dr. Mark Lamont Hill lit, lit up Vernon Jones. All right. And Vernon Jones is running as a Republican to uh, defeat um, Governor Brian Kemp. Uh, but he's not going to beat Stacey Abrams. Uh, he's not going to beat Stacey Abrams. If we look at this um, article that came out from. Uh, this one here is. From. Let's see. Let's go to this one here from um, NBC News. Florida Board of Education passes rule banning critical race theory in classrooms. And this just happened Thursday, Thursday, uh, June 10th. So you see these teachers here. OK. And you see this African-American teacher here as well. They're saying allow teachers to teach the truth. Allow teachers to teach the truth. Uh, uh, they were there during public comments on Florida's plans to ban teaching of critical race theory in public schools. Uh, this was in Jacksonville, Florida. OK, now the Florida State Board of Education unanimously voted to ban teaching ideas related to critical race theory uh, on Thursday, June 10th, making it one of the largest public school systems to fall in line with conservative efforts across the country to regulate certain classroom instruction of American history. Okay. So, so the first thing I want to, first thing I, I would ask them is, okay, now it's, what are you teaching about the history of slavery in this country? What are you teaching about the history of slavery? What, what are you teaching about the people who were here before slavery? Because they were native, they, the native Americans weren't the only one here before slavery existing before Europeans came. African people were here as well. Uh, th that's what we discussed with Dr. David M. Hotel in this book, The First Americans with Africans Documented Evidence. African people have been here in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. But I really want to know what are you teaching about the history of slavery? And that's why this study from the Southern Poverty Law Center is so important. Teaching hard history, American slavery, teaching hard history, American slavery. This is a 52 page study 
from the Southern Poverty Law Center that shows how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country and how to uh, and it lays out numerous ways to more correctly teach that history. OK, you can go to SPLCenter.org and download that study teaching hard history, American slavery. Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who's an associate professor of history at Ohio State University and one of the nephews of one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, he is on the advisory board. He actually headed up the advisory board that put this together. And I've interviewed him here on this show before. So uh, if this is something, this study right here is something that every school, I think, across the country should use. Because if they did, they would be teaching more accurate information about slavery. And it, it deals with how to teach this information age appropriately as well. OK, which is, which is very important also. So. Uh, the Florida State Board of Education unanimously voted to ban teaching ideas related to critical race theory Thursday, June 10th, making it one of the largest public school systems to fall in line with conservative efforts across the country to regulate certain classroom instruction of American history. The rule says, quote, instruction on the required topics must be factual and objective and may not suppress or distort significant historical events. Well, that means you got to throw out a lot of textbooks you all are using already. Because a, a lot of that stuff is wrong. That means you got to throw out a lot of textbooks you are, you're already using. Or distort significant, it may not suppress or distort significant historical events, such as the Holocaust, and may not define American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Um, based on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Okay, well, let's look at the Declaration of Independence. I got it right here. Let, let's look at the Declaration of Independence. Hold on. Wait. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, based upon principles in the Declaration of Independence. So, you mean like uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal? that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, not women, but men, deriving their just, po just powers from the consent of the governed. Um... So let's look at this again. This is what they said in their, in their law. This is what happens when you have dumbasses in state legislatures. OK, and you have an ignorant governor who supported this measure. Instruction on the required topics must be factual and objective and may not suppress or distort significant historical events. I wonder what they teach about Malcolm X. In, the, in these schools. I'm just curious. I wonder what they teach about Malcolm X. Okay. I wonder what they teach about Dr. King, Mega Evers, Marcus Garvey, the Black Panther Party for Self Defense, Robert F. Williams and the Black Guard, Nat Turner, Haitian Revolution. I, I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, and may not suppress or distort significant historical events such as the Holocaust and may not define American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Now, the question I would ask them is, uh, universal principles for who? Universal principles for who? Because at, at, at the time that the Declaration of Independence was drafted, June 28th, uh, was drafted by a five man committee, uh, June 28, 1776, and then is signed, uh, July 4th, 1776, uh, by the, by the first four of 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Many of them are slave owners. 
So when you start talking about now, this this is what you said. This ain't what I said. You said that uh, they may not define American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Now, the question I would ask is, who the hell does this apply to? This is what you said. And the question I'm asking you is when you when you say that uh, life, when you say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, who is we? That all men are created equal. Only men were here in this country. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Then why were Africans enslaved? Who who they didn't, they didn't have rights? They, so, you, so your argument is they didn't have rights. Therefore, you didn't take them away. They were just born with no rights. I know I understand born with uh, it, it, some were born into child slavery. But who set up the laws to deprive them of their nationalities? Who set up the laws to deprive them of their humanity? Who set up the laws to deprive them of their rights? This is what you see. Now, you said it may not define American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Who do these universal principles apply to? That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's, that's in the Declaration of Independence. Many of these people were slave owners, depriving African people of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is what's going on down in Florida. Florida has one of the biggest, one of the, one of the most racist histories in this country. Okay. In addition, the rule says teachers must, quote, serve as facilitators so student discussion and do not share their personal views or attempt to indoctrinate or persuade students to a particular point of view. Uh, now, who's going to go through and uh, audit the textbooks being used in Florida to make sure the textbooks are not indoctrinating students with a particular point of view? Because I can guarantee you they are. I can guarantee you they are. The board voted after hearing from Governor Ron DeSantis, who uh, the racists believe is a racist. And over 30 speakers from both sides of the issue, several people at the meeting chanted, allow teachers to teach the truth, allow teachers to teach the truth, forcing a recess. The Florida Times Union of Jacksonville reported. Now, the move was a victory for uh, Donald Trump supporter Governor Ron DeSantis who has been a vocal critic of critical race theory in schools, but critical race theory is not being taught in schools. Most of these people who are critics probably can't even tell you what critical race theory is. He told board members, many of whom he appointed by video, many of whom he appointed, he told them by video, before the vote that students should be served with fact-based curricula by teachers who should, quote, not be trying to indoctrinate them with ideology, end quote. Who's going to audit the curriculum in Florida and the textbooks to make sure it's fact based? Governor Ron DeSantis, who's up for re-election in 2022 and needs to be voted out of office, said, quote, I, do, I, I think it's going to cause a lot of divisions. I think it's going to cause a lot of divisions. I think it'll cause people to think of themselves more as a member of a particular race based on skin color rather than based on the content of their character and based on their hard work and uh what they're trying to accomplish in life now this is the same guy who says systemic racism doesn't exist he was on fox news uh what was that third uh, thursday august 28th on the uh, when they had their little uh forum asking is america a racist country he's on fox news saying america's is, uh, systemic racism doesn't exist we'll continue this on the other side of the break and then we'll talk about uh the story dealing with uh, the white farmers who sued the Biden administration because they're not included in the $4 billion in loan forgiveness for African-American farmers and farmers of color to deal with decades of racism and discrimination from the federal government. You got white farmers who got 26, almost $26 billion in COVID relief aid from the, from the Trump administration in 2020. 
And African-American farmers got one tenth of one percent, twenty point eight million dollars. But now these white farmers are crying right white tears and they're suing crime discrimination, saying that they're being discriminated against because they can get loan forgiveness as well. OK, they, they want crime discrimination when they got almost twenty six billion dollars in twenty twenty from the Trump administration. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. This is the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Right. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 9, 10 a.m. Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I knew they were going to play the disclaimer before. I knew they I knew they were gonna play the disclaimer, but anyway, they do that every for everybody. I think maybe they do it mostly, but <laughs> I knew I knew they were gonna play the disclaimer. But anyway, it is what it is. Um <laughs> Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, June 13th, 2021. And we are live. The calling number is uh, 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a question or comment. Right before the break, we were talking, in our, in our first hour, basically, we, we were talking about what happened in Florida with the State Board of Education. And the Florida State Board of Education uh, passed a rule on Thursday, June 10th, banning teaching critical race theory in classrooms or teaching elements of critical race theory in classrooms. We're going through breaking this down, showing the hypocrisy behind it. Um, and then also we're going to get into the second topic in just a minute with what happened with uh, African-American farmers and $4 billion in loan forgiveness being paused by a uh, judge in Wisconsin because of a lawsuit by white farmers who are whining and crying and saying they're being discriminated against. Okay. Uh, also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So this helps support the African History Network, helps us keep broadcasting, stay on the air. We're here six days a week. OK. And as many of you know, I've said it before, you know, I do I do the show for free. I don't get paid to be here. OK. Uh, so this helps support us keep doing the research, um, pay some of the bills. It helped me get to and from Atlanta. Uh, so I'm speaking there for the um, uh, Juneteenth Festival, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th. Uh, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So the, uh, you see up on the screen, we have the real African History Network Cash App account. Our actual tag is dollar sign the AHN show S H O W. Shows my name there. Michael has my picture. These other two are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. Somebody set these up. They've been stealing money from us. I've already reported them to Cash App. So I'm trying to go through the process. All right. And then also visit JuneteenthATL.com, JuneteenthATL.com and uh the information is there about the Juneteenth Festival, the ninth annual Juneteenth uh, Festival at Centennial Park, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th. All right. Um, I want to go back to this article here from NBCNews.com. This is dealing with what took place in Florida. Now, there have been about 20 states, and we're going to go to clip uh, two, uh, Jalen, just a second here. There have been about 20 states to pass some type of bill, either banning critical race theory or dealing with um, what can be taught in school, et cetera. OK, what can be taught dealing with uh, um, uh, slavery, all different types of things like this. And, and, and I'm telling you, uh, when I see these attacks personally, it hurts me as a historian. This stuff hurts me. I understand how dangerous this is when you shut down. And you try to control what's being taught. And they're being they're being you have people who are afraid of the truth being taught in schools. This is not about um, making white children feel guilty. This is not teaching uh, white children or oh, your ancestors are oppressors or your parents are oppressors. Anything. This is not about it, about that. This is about 
being able to have a more fair and just society, understand the history of how we got here, how to correct these structural inequities, understanding how laws and policies have created these structural inequities. This is this is what this is about. OK, but what what's happened is and there was a. Um, uh, on All in with Chris Hayes on. Let's see. What day was this? Uh, on All in with Chris Hayes, I think it was on the 10th. I think it was June 10th, third, June 9th. On June 9th, uh, he did a segment dealing with critical race theory. And he put this graphic up. Now, this is a quote from uh, a white male conservative named Christopher Ruffo, R-U-F-O. And you all can Google this. He did this tweet March 15th, 2020. This is the whole plan of conservatives dealing with critical race theory. This is the whole plan. OK, he lays it out. He says the goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and we will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. OK, now what he's saying is that they have they, they have distorted what critical race theory is. And what they're doing is they're just lumping everything they don't like about race and teaching about race and racism, systemic racism, slavery, 1619 project. They're just lumping it all into a bag that they're labeling. Uh, they're, they're putting this all into a bag that they're labeling critical race theory. OK, this is what's taking place. Hold on. Let me see something. here. They're putting this all into a bag that they that they are labeling. Uh, critical race theory. All right. So then all you have to do is say critical race theory and and you have all these people who are against it. But then when you ask them, explain to me what it is, none of them can tell you what it is. Because they don't know. Most of them haven't read any uh, critical race theory uh, scholars, Kimberly Crenshaw or anybody like that. Derek Bell. Most of them haven't, haven't read anything about that. Most of them, I guarantee you, are ignorant of history as well. Because if they actually understood history. They actually understood how laws and policies that now distribute wealth, power, and resources into the hands of Europeans. They would understand that this is important. Okay, the history has to be taught. You may not um, necessarily take elements from critical race theory. Critical race theory is not taught in K through twelve. It's taught in law schools and graduate schools. It's not taught in K through twelve. Okay, it's a legal analysis. So research Christopher Ruffo, R U F O. Tell him I say hi. If we go back to this article here from NBC News, and once again, read, why don't you read all these uh, articles I give you, okay? Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe a word that I say. You go research this yourself. This is why I give you the sources. I want you to go read this stuff. Create tabs in your browsers, because I have thousands of articles archived. Create tabs in your browsers. I have a tab for critical race theory. I have one for ancient African history. Things like that. I have thousands of articles uh, um, archived. OK, and go go research this. You don't have to believe me. So Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican governor of Florida, said, quote, I think it's going to cause a lot of divisions. Critical race theory, you know, it's not being taught in schools. He said, I think it'll cause people to think of themselves more as a member of a particular race based on skin color rather than based on the content of their character and based on their hard work and what they're trying to accomplish in life, end quote. But this is the same guy that says systemic racism doesn't exist. Now, several groups, including the Florida Education Association, a union that represents teachers across the state, opposed, opposed the rule change, saying it would do a greater disservice to students to cover up history. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to cover up history. I want to do they teach about Axe Handle Saturday? In uh, uh, Florida, do they do they teach that uh, uh, Jackie Robinson was ran out of Sanford, Florida? OK, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just curious um, if we how many how many people are familiar with Axe Handle Saturday? 
uh, August 27, 1960. There was an article. We just talked about this uh, a few days ago here on the show. Read this article here from uh, Washington Post. OK. Axe handle Saturday, the Klan's vicious attack on black protesters in Florida 60 years ago. Do they, are they, are they going to teach about this or are they going to say this is critical race theory? If you if you teach about Axe handle Saturday that happened in Florida. OK, are they saying, oh, you can't teach about this? OK. Um, August 27th, 1960, a year of uh, a year of lunch counter sit ins by civil rights activists. The opening salvo had been fired on February 1st, 1960, when four African-American college students sat down at a whites only college uh, uh, lunch counter inside an F.W. Woolworth five and dime store in Greensboro, North Carolina. By spring of 1960, sit in campaigns led by young African-Americans had been organized in cities all over the South, including Lexington, Kentucky, Little Rock, Baltimore, Richmond and Nashville. Surprised white onlookers spat on, they spit on them, spat and chewed and spewed racial epithets at demonstrators and sometimes physically attacked them. But as spring blossomed into summer, white supremacists farther south, having watched the protest, protest achieve success elsewhere, switched to high alert. So when young African Americans uh, began staging sit-ins at a whites-only Woolworth lunch counter in downtown Jacksonville, Florida, that some of the Ku Klux Klan organized. On the morning of what has become notori notoriously known as Axe Handle Saturday, more than 200 white men wielding wooden axes launched a, wooden axe handles, I should say. More than 200 white men wielding wooden axe handles launched a vicious attack on African-Americans and passerby. Before pulling the plug on an in-person convention in Jacksonville, Florida, Donald Trump was scheduled to speak there on the 60th, 60th anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday. That was last year, 2020, angering local activists. OK, so um, the 1960 Ku Klux Klan attack in Florida signaled a sharp turn in the cascading sit-in movement from spontaneous acts of racism to coordinated white supremacist brutality. They changed from spontaneous acts of racism to coordinated white supremacist brutality, according to Stanford, Stanford University history professor Claiborne Carson. Read now, uh, I hope they teach about this here, or, or are they going to say that's critical race theory? You teach about what the Klan did. See, now this, this is the real reason why some of them are afraid because some of their great grandfathers were some of these white supremacists they're beating at, at African Americans. And if they go home, start asking questions, right? They're going to find out some things about their family that, you know, some people don't want them to know. This, so this, is, this, this is one of the real reasons. Some of those people are still alive. Some of those some of those people's great grandchildren are going to be in school learning about what their what their relatives did. And read this article from Washington Post. Axe handle Saturday, the Klan's vicious attack on black protesters in Florida 50 years ago. This is years ago. This is from August 27, 2020. So are they going to teach about this? Or are they going to say that's critical race theory? If you but that happened in Florida. That's that's your history in Florida. You gonna say that's critical race theory too? Don't teach that. All right. Uh, so let's go back to this one here from NBC News, and I want to go to this clip here. Let me flip back over to this three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the calling number. If you have a quick question or comment, three one three seven seven eight. 7,600 is the call-in number if you have a quick question or comment. We're going to talk about the African-American farmers in just a minute because all this is connected. All this is dealing with white supremacy and racism. Some people want to act like it doesn't exist because they benefit from it. That's, that's what it is. The magician doesn't want you to know how they keep doing these magic tricks. Several groups, including the Florida Education Association, a union that represents teachers across the state, 
opposed the rule change, saying it would do a greater disservice to students to cover up history. Andrew Spar, the uh, union president, the, the, un the union's president, said in a statement, quote, students deserve the best education we can provide. And that means giving them a true picture of their world and our shared history as Americans. Hiding facts doesn't change them. Hi, what he's saying is hiding the facts don't change the facts. You're trying to distort the history and distort the facts because you don't like the history. Hiding the facts don't do not change the facts. He said if giving if giving students a education is the goal, the rule could be amended to say in part, quote, instruction on the required topics must be factual and objective and may not suppress or distort significant historical events such as the Holocaust, slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, and Jim Crow, end quote, he said. A particular sore point is the use of the word indoctrinate in the rule, indoctrinate in the rule, which the, 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 the teachers union says presents an overly negative view of classroom instruction. The, the, the Florida uh, school board chose to keep the word in the rule, the word indoctrinate. Florida's move was widely expected as a national debate intensifies about how race should be used as a lens, how race should be used as a lens to, hold on, keep jumping around, how race should be used as a lens in classrooms to examine the country's tumultuous history. Critical race theory is a concept that seeks to understand racism and inequality in the U.S. by exploring and exposing the ways it affects legal and social systems. See, this is what I'm saying. They don't want this to be exposed. They don't want you to let the rabbit out the bag. The magician doesn't want you to see how he keeps doing the magic tricks. They are pulling back the curtain on the wizard. You, you go back and watch the Wizard of Oz, okay, uh, uh, with Judy Garland, the original Wizard of Oz. You watch the Wiz too. Wiz is cool, but I'm talking about the Wizard of Oz. Let's go back to the original one. You see when they meet the wizard. You see this, you see this big ominous character with a deep voice, and they're using technology to make themselves seem bigger and stronger and smarter than they and than he actually was. So Toto goes around to the side, pulls back the curtain, and exposes a dwarf manipulating technology to give the impression that he's much more powerful than he actually is. With critical race theory and actually understanding history, you're pulling the curtain back on the wizard. That's what they can't let happen. That's why they're fighting this so hard. Critical race theory is a concept that seeks to understand racism and inequality in the U.S. by exploring and exposing the wizard or the Grand Wizard, and exposing the ways it affects legal and social systems. Critical race theory is not taught in Florida public schools or in any other public school system, but it has become a tremendous point of contention for conservative leaders because they don't want you to understand, they don't want to expose Racism and white supremacy. That's what this is because it's benefiting them. Okay, uh, I want to go to clip two here. This is from this is in this article here from NBC News. This is actually from NBC Now explaining the controversy behind critical race theory. This is from June 11th, 2021. Let's go to this clip, uh, Jalen. Oh, then we up against a break. Hold on. We, what we got to do with this clip on the other side of the break? All right. <laughs> Hold on. Stand by. All right. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, 
Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, uh, June 13th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Call the numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment. Um, right before the break, we were talking about what took place in Florida on uh, Thursday, June 10th regarding uh, the Florida State Board of Education passing a rule uh, banning the teaching of critical race theory in Florida schools, K through 12, even though critical race theory is not being taught in Florida schools, K through 12, okay? But this is part of this whole uh, fear and part of this whole uh, conservative campaign to attack critical race theory, the 1619 Project, different things like that. OK, so I want to go to uh, this clip here. This is from this is from uh, NBC News now. And it's in the article. The clip is in the article that we've been talking about here uh, from NBC News. And, and also there's an article from um, uh, CNN that, that I showed you at the beginning of the show uh, explaining the controversy behind critical race theory. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. Some Ohio lawmakers want to ban what is known as critical race theory. Governor Kemp pushing back against teaching critical race theory in Georgia schools. CRT is not an honest dialogue. Republican lawmakers and some concerned parents are waging war against critical race theory and its role in the classroom today. It's a 40-year-old academic framework based on the concept that racism impacts our legal and social systems. So is the outrage an overreaction or is it justified? I teach critical race theory throughout my class, or at least I bring the sensibility. Dr. LaToya Baldwin-Clark teaches law at UCLA's Critical Race Studies program. She says these are some of the basic themes of critical race theory. Race is not real, but racism is. Racism is ordinary and baked into our institutions and systems. Not all groups experience racism the same way. Whiteness comes with material and psychological benefits. But the uproar over CRT these days isn't really directed at college-level professors like Dr. Baldwin-Clark, necessarily. It's aimed at K-12 classrooms. After the summer of social unrest, CRT ideas are appearing in grade school lesson plans. That's sparking backlash from conservatives and some liberals who claim this actually creates more division among younger students. What we see now, though, is kind of a bastardization of critical race theory. Dr. Eric Smith is an associate professor of rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania. He's been speaking out against CRT. I think it's a travesty to tell kids especially, right, that because of this systemic racism, you're going to always have it hard. But unlike other critics, Dr. Smith doesn't support invoking CRT as a way to censor honest conversations about race. Unfortunately, there are people um, on the right with their agendas and see this as an opportunity to squelch uh, discussion about race, period. And that's not good. It's past time for America to discard the left-wing myth of systemic racism. From Texas to Ohio, Republican lawmakers in at least six states are turning their animus into action, introducing measures that limit how schools can teach historical truths about racism, a lot of these laws don't explicitly mention critical race theory, but instead use broad language to define what is and isn't acceptable. Take Kentucky, for example. Republican State Representative Joseph Fisher recently pre-filed a bill that would ban concepts teaching that an individual is, quote, inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. Another line says you can't refer to the United States as, quote, fundamentally or irredeemably racist or sexist. In Oklahoma, Governor Kevin Stitt signed a bill into law that bans lessons, including the concept that one should feel discomfort, guilt, or stress on account of their race or sex. The discourse is critical race theory teaches our children to think that white people are evil. And that's not the case. We are not teaching white children that they are oppressors or that they are bad or that they should feel guilty 
what we are doing is we are um, actually making our pedagogy more critical so that all of our children understand how we got to where we are today. Republicans are also leading a movement on the national front, arguing the mere mention of systemic racism is racist. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton's Combating Racist Training in the Military Act already has the support of 30 GOP representatives. The Stop CRT Act would essentially codify former President Donald Trump's executive order banning diversity and racial equity training for federal employees. I I don't believe in banning CRT. I think that's the wrong move. I think what we need to ban is saying that CRT is the end-all, be-all truth. Um, It should be a lens through which we can see the world. Right. It shouldn't be the lens. Some educators and Democrats are concerned these laws might whitewash history and handicap teachers' ability to effectively teach slavery or Jim Crow. During a recent press conference in Kentucky, Democratic Governor Andy Bashir expressed concern about the bill proposed in his state. I think once you start legislating what can and can't be taught in, in school, um, it, especially in the framework of politics, it gets really dangerous. And the Oklahoma City Board of Education unanimously denounced the bill just passed in their state, with one board member describing it as an insult. I honestly don't see the laws themselves um, being particularly um, effective. These laws may not have teeth in the classroom, but they could deliver political gains at the ballot box. Tweets like this one from Christopher Rufo, one of the right's most outspoken critics of CRT, suggest a broad and somewhat confusing definition of the concept is exactly the point, especially as many conservatives look to rally voters around culture wars like this one ahead of next year's midterms. Hey, pause, pause, pause right there. I think that's the end of the clip anyway, Jalen. Isn't that the end of the clip? I think, okay, good. All right, so they just mentioned... Christopher Rufo. This is the tweet that I talked about early in the show from conservative Christopher Rufo. Okay. This, this is obfuscating, distorting, confusing what critical race theory is, and just throwing everything that you don't like about the talk about race and systemic racism and slavery in 1619 Project, put it all into one category called critical race theory. He said, this, now, this is his tweet from March 15th, 2021. He said the goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory, immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with America. So they're going to relabel critical race theory to be what it uh, what is not. But this is what they want to relabel it as to to create this taint around it and just throw all these things they don't like dealing with the conversation about race. Throw this into the to, to the bag of critical race theory so they can attack it and shut it down. It's like creating a straw man argument. It's like creating a straw man argument. It's like. Um, if um, um, you have a politician who says, uh, uh, I never said, you know, such and such. Right. Well, nobody said you said that. You know, it's like uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. It's. Um, uh, if you have um, I was thinking of McMaster's um, it used to be in the Trump administration, but it's like saying. um, um you know, I never said this person did such and such. And you 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 hold a press conference and you say, I never said that person said such and such. Well, nobody said you did. You creating a straw man argument to divert attention from what it was you did say or what you did do so that people can now run headlines and say he said he did not do this. Well, nobody said you did it. You're creating a straw man argument to divert attention from what the real issue is. All right. So read the rest of this article here from uh, NBC News. Uh, Florida Board of Education passes uh, passes rule banning critical race theory in schools. Okay, read the rest of this article. And as the article goes on to say, this is why it's important to read like the full article. 
because I see people they read like the headlines and start commenting on social media or doing videos and they just read the headlines. Um, when you scroll down and read this article, it says critical race theory is not taught in Florida public schools or in any other public school system, but it has become a tremendous point of contention for conservative leaders. At least 16 states are considering or have enacted bills that would limit how schools frame American history. See, they're afraid of the truth. That's what this is. All right, so read that article. Now, uh, I wanna go quickly to this next topic. I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. And we dealt with, now, you know, we've been talking about African-American farmers, the plight of African-American farmers. We've been talking about the, the $4 billion in loan forgiveness that's in the American Rescue Plan, okay? And uh, that's for African-American farmers and farmers of color. It's African-Americans that, that fought for that, African-American farmers. The reason why that, that portion is in the American Rescue Plan, the reason why it's in there in the first place is because of Senator Raphael Warnock and uh, Senator Cory Booker, okay, trying to help African-American farmers. So you had, um, you had this ruling that came down uh, in Wisconsin from a, a judge in Wisconsin on uh, Thursday, June 10th. And a judge has put a, uh, put a stop or a pause on the program, on the debt relief program, because white farmers have sued and they said that they're being discriminated against. It's unfair. Is reverse discrimination? It said it's, it's, they said they're being their constitutional rights are being violated. Okay, um, judge halts billions in debt relief. And I'm looking at this one here from uh, Washington Post. Judge halts billions in debt relief for farmers of color as conservative group for white farmers sue. Okay, so. We talked about this on uh Roland. We're gonna go to clip uh we're gonna go to clip three, Jalen. We talked about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered, and Roland interviewed uh John Wesley Boyd Jr. of uh the Black Farmers Union to uh discuss this. Then he went to his panel and I was on his panel. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. Uh and again, just so how we always are trying to connect the dots on this show, uh the whole issue of what's happening with black farmers. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the money that was put in uh, the bill that was recently passed uh, to correct what took place with black, black, uh, black farmers, $5 billion going to black farmers and other disadvantaged black farmers. Uh, remember, we had the uh, head of agriculture right here on the show discussing that, uh, saying they were about to start um, sending that money out. What then happened? White farmers, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is... This is against us. This is discrimination against us. And then you have black people. Yes. Then you have black people like Senator Tim Scott, who goes on Face the Nation and is saying the exact same thing. These white farmers are saying, oh, this is reverse racism. OK, but I don't recall Senator Tim Scott saying a damn thing about black farmers uh, and the little money they got out of the twenty five billion. That was that sent out where the white farmers got all of that money. Okay, this is a loan forgiveness program. Our farmers of color. U.S. District Judge William Griesbach out of Wisconsin has temporarily suspended the program due to the lawsuit alleging it discriminates against white farmers. Now he will pay up to 120 uh, percent of, of direct or guaranteed farm loan balances for Black, American Indian, Hispanic, Asian American, or Pacific Islander farmers as part of the COVID-19 pandemic relief plan. Again, for all the young people out there who said ain't nothing happened with black people, no, this is not a black specific program. But guess what? If you look at those numbers, you're likely going to have black farmers who are going to get more of the five billion than all the other groups out there. Okay, so just for y'all folks who keep saying there's nothing that's been done for black people, joining us right now is John Boyd, founder and president of the National Black Farmers Association. John, glad to have you back on the show. Uh, we've talked about this here. This is no shock. That they, that they went to a federal judge in Wisconsin, where a lot of these white folks are, get them to rule. And while I'm talking about collecting the dot, when whoever you vote for, the president, 
gets to nominate federal judges. The Senate gets to confirm federal judges. And so those 100 federal judges Mitch McConnell held up under Obama that Trump mm-hmm. was able to appoint, that's what you're dealing with here. And so there's a direct correlation to public policy passed by, by policymakers that impact black people that federal judges can either affirm or deny. That's correct. And well, you know, it's, it's a national disgrace that uh, we fought 30 years. And, and uh, the last time I was on your show, I was urging uh, Secretary Bill Sack to get the payments out to the farmers as quickly as possible. And if he had got the money to us, uh, we wouldn't be caught in this uh, a trick bag here, so to speak. But here you have white farmers who have filed in so far six different federal courthouses around the country, uh, Texas and uh, Wisconsin and uh, uh, all of these other states around the country. And we probably wind up in the Supreme Court, you know, trying to uh, put all these cases together. Uh, the, the National Black Farmers Association has already filed a amicus brief, you know, opposing all of this, all of this, uh, you know, rhetoric. And here you have, just like you described, all of these Republican judges who says it's going to be some sort of harm to, to white folks if uh, you pay black people. Anytime in this country you put uh, uh, money, uh, uh, black people in, in the same sentence in the federal government, everybody goes uh, crazy. Uh, this was only a small tad bit of what we had in, in the whole book of bill. So we broke that off thinking we could, uh, you know, get it through without a whole lot of pushback. And, and so far we've had banks that came out against us. We talked about that last time. And now you have all of these lawsuits around the country uh, from, from primarily, uh, you know, white farmers who don't want to see black and other farmers of color get a, a, a dime in this country. And, and uh, you know, when you know, when did we say enough is enough? And, and uh, I was listening to you on your commentary. You've done a, a great job of uh, uh, black America. Wake up and look at this. Uh, you know, here you have a targeted group of people who've been discriminated against by the federal government. We lost millions of acres of land. It's been, it's been documented and uh, we didn't get injunctive relief in either of the two lawsuits, injunctive relief being land and inventory and or debt relief that we've been asking Congress for. This is not a new program for white farmers so that, that excludes white farmers. White farmers have been getting the debt relief the whole time, and rolling since 1995, they've got a half trillion dollars worth of cheap uh, told, told out to white farmers, 99% to white farmers under the Trump administration alone. Thirty billion dollars uh, uh, that went out to white farmers. So, how many times they want to collect, and how many times they they want to get all of the money all of the time? All, yeah, they, 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 they want. Hey, it hey, was a dollar. They want. Pause it. Pause it right there, Jamie. Got- pause it right there. Just back it up about 20, 30 seconds. Okay, so we've been covering all this on this show. That's John Boyd Jr., president of the Black Farmers Union. Okay, if you look at this article here from March twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, from the Washington Post. Uh, the Washington Post interviewed uh, the new uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, who was the Secretary of Agriculture under the Obama administration. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack says only 0.1 percent of Trump administration's COVID-19 farm relief went to black farmers. Only 0.1 percent. OK, if you read this article here, uh it says of those identify of those who identified their race race or ethnicity black farmers received only 20.8 million dollars okay 20.8 million with the m dollars of nearly 26 billion dollars in two rounds of payments under the coronavirus food assistance program announced by the trump administration last april 2020 white farmers got almost 26 billion dollars but they weren't crying discrimination then okay uh secretary of agriculture tom vilsack said quote we saw 99 percent of the money going to white farmers and one percent going to socially disadvantaged farmers and if you break that down to how much went to black farmers it's 0.1 percent is one tenth of one percent he said look at it another way the top 10 percent of farmers in the country receives 60 percent of the value of the COVID payments and the bottom 10 percent receive 0.26 percent about a quarter of one percent okay 
Now, uh, 3.4 million farmers in the U.S., only 45,000 African-American farmers. We've lost. We had about a million African-American farmers in 1920. Today, we got 45,000. African-American farmers have lost 92% of their land, 12 million acres of land over the past 100 years, largely due to discrimination, racism, and policies coming from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the federal government. All right, let's go back to this clip, uh, Katie. Since 1995, they've got a half trillion dollars with a T uh, told out to white farmers, 99% to white farmers, under the Trump administration alone, $30 billion uh, uh, that went out to white farmers. So how many times they want to collect and how many times they, they want to get all of the money all of the time or yeah, they, 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 they want, it was a dollar, they want, they, like, they mad, they mad, you got a penny. Oh, no, they want that penny, too. And, and but, but, but also, I need you to respond, John, to these yeah. ignorant black people who yeah. I see commenting, who go, well, this is just a small pittance, this really is nothing. Right. Tell that to one of the black farmers, this is nothing. Who waiting, who waiting, uh, we have farmers who call here, rolling every single day at the National Black Farmers Association. Uh, our brother book, when are we going to get this debt relief? Uh, we have black farmers who are waiting on the brink of farm foreclosure. That means we lose more land. We lose more black farmers if we don't get these payments and, uh, you know, relief out to, to black farmers. And, uh, uh, you know, as I, as I talked about earlier about the conversations with uh, Secretary Vilsack, you have to move swift uh, uh, with stuff like this and, and, and giving these people all this time to uh, come out against the measure. And if they had told the money out the way that they did white farmers uh, immediately after the bill passes, the monies are, are deposited in, into their checking accounts or, or whatever have you there, the same swift action should have been uh, done in this particular law. It's no longer a bill, people. It's a law. And it's, it, and uh, we haven't received the monies. You know, and, 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 and the thing is, you know, when I hear these nutcases go, well, the black farmers need reparations. Well, okay, please please explain to me that when that's going to pass. Hell, a study yeah. can't even get passed. The reality <laughs> is, this got passed. Mm -hmm. This yeah. got passed. It got passed. Well, and, and you know how long uh, I was talking to you about debt relief, brother, on your television show uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and this has been going on for 30 years. And it just passed, people. So right. just, all of these years of struggle, we get it. And now we have, like you say, uh, you know, black people who are lost. Uh, you know, a, a lost ball and high reads that don't understand history. And for people who don't under, uh, understand history, we take this a little a quick second and tell them slavery was wrong and, and, and held on American soil. Sharecropping was wrong and held on American soil. Jim Crow laws that uh, took millions of acres away from black farmers was wrong. And every time they come out uh, uh, saying these types of statements, they always leave the fact of what history did to black farmers and, and in this case, black people in this country. The, uh, and, and, so, and so here's what these white farmers are banking on. So everybody needs to understand. What they're not banking on is federal judge puts a stop to it. It gets appealed. It now goes to the next level. They, these white farmers want this to go all the way to the Supreme Court, to a six to three conservative Supreme Court, okay, which is, which is anchored by uh, that clueless uh, Clarence Thomas, that they will declare this to be unconstitutional so black farmers aren't able to get this money. That's what these white farmers are trying to do. Well, that's what they're doing right now because they're delaying the payments uh, to black farmers. And right now, we're well, probably as we speak, we're probably looking at a two-year court battle, to, uh, to say the least, because I'm going to fight them all, all the way to the Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have to win the, the, the public the public support here. Uh, uh, we need the support, especially in this case of black America, to wake up and start talking about this travesty. Here we have a law in place and we have white farmers and, uh, like you said, some, some naive brothers out there uh, uh, on the wrong side of the issue who are saying they don't want us to receive the money, uh, that it's going to harm them if we, if we compensate black farmers and Hispanic farmers and Native American farmers all of the people who have been harmed, uh, you know, by this government. Uh, something is ter terribly wrong with that picture. Uh, it is. And so, uh, look, uh, you know, look, we've been right there with you, uh, yeah. the National Black Farmers, uh, a whole lot of people out here running their mouths uh, who have not been talking about this issue. Unfortunately, it's a lot of mainstream networks 
with not then calling you, having you on on a regular basis. And That's so, exactly, and they really do because uh, you know they have, you know this is this is a big issue here. You know you. You got uh, land and money in the same sentence, and and for black people, that's that's a whole lot, and, and we have to get on top of this, and we have to stop the land loss, and the only way to do that is to get money in the hands of uh, our needy black farmers and other farmers of color in this country. Well, and what people also don't realize is is that you you're seeing a, a renewed focus also among younger African Americans uh, who are now looking at farming. As a sister, I know uh, Rachel Ponder. She's an activist out of Georgia. Uh, and she's actually going through uh, classes now uh, to become a, a black farmer. And so the, you, you see African Americans who are creating urban farms, who are creating this yeah. uh, to deal with food deserts. And so people need to understand that there are black people in rural America who this impacts. Yeah. We're talking about Virginia, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, Texas, Florida. But it's also these things impact what's happening in inner cities where African Americans are trying to become more self reliant, even with urban farms. And as we go, Roland, we have a, a scholarship program we just announced, uh, uh, probably about $4 million scholarship, a full ride uh, for four years. And, and we need uh, young blacks uh, uh, to apply for this scholarship. So they can look at that on the National Black Farmers Association.org or blackfarmers.org. Uh, go out and apply. We've got to get uh, young blacks, just like you said back into farm and, and, and this is a, the best way to do it by, by educating them. And we'll be sure to uh, to get that out and I'll push that out on social media as well because, uh, yeah, the opportunities are there. Uh, you know, my brother actually was a business major at Texas A&M, uh, then ended up actually ec- uh, graduating with an agricultural economics degree uh, because there were, op- there were so all of these companies were looking for to hire black folks in agriculture that's and again, right. we're sitting here thinking, well, agriculture means just a farm, not realizing these major companies, DuPont, he actually got hired by DuPont uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out of college. Uh, and so that's one of the areas. Uh, but again, it's, 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 it's redefining for people uh, when they yes. hear agriculture, not thinking it's, it's just completely, oh, my goodness, you're going to be on a tractor. No, agriculture is the second largest budget in the federal government. Absolutely. Well, you're hitting all the nails with the, with the hammer, and we got to be a part of that. And, and we have to get more blacks into active business in this country. And, uh, you know, for, for the people who, who guide the food, you know, guide the country people. Uh, we've got to get a, a, a foothold and start to control some of the, the food that's produced in this country so we can start directing the way that things are run in this country. All right, then. John Boyd, we still appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, brother. Thank, Thank you, brother. sir. I want to bring our panel back in. Uh, when I was just talking about, again, redefining, redefining what these things means, I mean, I, I, I sort of think about um, uh, Michael. Uh, I was talking to, I remember when I was uh, at a, a sister who was graduated from Texas A&M with a degree in marketing. And, and I was telling her to apply for a job at the newspaper where I work. She was like, newspaper? I said, sister, PepsiCo and Coke are not the only people who hire folks for marketing jobs. Right. I said, right. every major company has marketing departments. Mm-hmm. And part of the problem for, for, uh, for a lot of us, again, many black people have been raised where we're just sort of very finite in our thinking in terms of what the opportunities are. And so uh, there was a professor, uh, Dr. Alvin Lark, who was, in the ag- who was in the agriculture department at Texas A&M, uh, who was the one for my brother. No. Um, you didn't want to switch your major. He was trying to get more African Americans to switch. See, many of them were business majors. Well, a lot of people right. uh, were, were then leaving the business business department, and he was trying to say, "Look, it's the same thing. Forget what that title is on your degree. What are the jobs that are there when you're able to come out of college? And that's the thing: the opportunities that are made available." Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I remember, uh, you know, my degrees in business administration with a major in marketing. And, you know, I remember in the business school, a lot of us uh, are geared towards corporations or uh, those in accounting. At the time, it was the six, big six accounting firms that geared toward the big six accounting firms. Those in marketing were geared towards some of the big ad agencies, things like this. And then you uh, learn about the reality of racism on the real world. <laughs> and that's when I learned how racism 
the marketing really was and advertising agencies really were things like this. But yeah, you know, there's a there's a a, a, a resurgence when it comes to urban farms. Okay, we see that here in Detroit, brothers like Maliki Kenny and others, uh, uh, D Town uh, Urban Farms. And this bill right here, I, I want people to really, really understand. I don't think people understand that this uh, four billion dollars in um, loan forgiveness that it, this is in the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan. No Republicans voted for this bill in the House of Representatives of the U.S. Senate. Zero. Zero. No, no Republicans. There's over 200 Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives. They voted no. The 50 Republicans in the Senate voted no on the bill. The only reason why you have this bill is because African Americans, Latinos, and others went out and voted in 2020. And then you had uh, John, uh, John Ossoff and uh, Raphael Warnock that went in Georgia. Okay? And this is the only reason why you have this bill. And this passed through the, during the budget reconciliation process. So it was like 51, 51, 50. That's the only reason why you have this. And it, and it was Senator Cory Booker and Senator Raphael Warnock who put this portion into the bill for black farmers. Now, now lastly, you had um, uh, Tom Vilsack on the show. And Tom Vilsack did an interview with the Washington Post March 25th. He talked about how under the Trump administration in 2020, white farmers got almost $26 billion. Almost $26 billion. African-American farmers got one-tenth of one percent. They got $20.8 million out of 26 billion. None of these white farmers were talking about discrimination when that happened. Senator Lindsey Graham wasn't talking about discrimination uh, against black farmers because they only got one tenth of 1%. Uh, Senator Tim Scott, who is really the Isaiah T. Montgomery <laughs> of the Republican Party, and Isaiah T. Montgomery, he voted alone in the 1890 Mississippi. He voted along with the new Mississippi Constitution that was discriminated against black people. That's Senator Tim Scott, the new Isaiah T. Montgomery. So we, this is an example of how elections have consequences, brother. All right, pause, pause, pause right there, uh, Jalen. Pause right there. Okay, um, and, and read the article uh, that I talked about at the beginning of the show, and I did a whole show on this Thursday, June 10th, from the Washington Post, the Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. Quote, we came here to exclude the Negro, end quote. And this is what's being implemented right now with almost 400 voter restriction bills in 48 state legislatures being pushed by Republicans. They're using the same playbook. Uh, and Isaiah T. Montgomery, who, who was um, uh, in the state legislature in Mississippi, African-American, founder of Bayou, Mississippi, mayor of Bayou, Mississippi, he voted for the Mississippi state constitution that instituted poll taxes and literacy tests. Read this article here. Isaiah T. Montgomery. This is before Clarence Thomas. You have Isaiah T. Montgomery. All right. That was from uh, Roland Martin and Filter Friday, June 11th. Uh, we'll post a link here. Uh, follow Roland on uh, Twitter, Roland S. Martin, and on, I mean, uh, YouTube, Roland S. Martin, and on Facebook, uh, Roland Martin on Facebook. You can watch the show there. I'm on every Friday as a panelist. Lastly, uh, we, well, we have time here. But uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're going to uh, continue this discussion. We're going to talk about Mega Evers uh, next. He was uh, assassinated June 12th. 1963. Uh, I'll be in Atlanta Friday, June 18th through uh, Sunday, June 20th for the Juneteenth uh, festival there at uh, Olympic uh, Centennial Park. Visit JuneteenthATL.com uh, for more information. Uh, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And uh, this helps us keep broadcasting six days a week. This helped me get uh, to and from Atlanta because I got to uh, cover expenses uh, for this trip uh, to Atlanta and back. Uh, I'll have a vendor booth there as well. You can come uh, check me out there. I'll be there all three days. I'm speaking Saturday and Sunday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the amphitheater at the uh, Centennial Olympic Park. You can still register for the online course I teach on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We had a great class this past Saturday. Our guest speaker was Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. So we'll post the link here as soon as you register. It's a 10-week online course. As soon as you register, you can watch the class we just had with Dr. David M. Hotep. His new book will be out in about two or three weeks, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. And uh, we, I mean, we dealt with uh, ancient African history. We dealt with the African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. But he talked about a new discovery in Central America 
that pushes uh, an African presence in Mexico going back about 250,000 years ago. All right. So those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. Right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you uh, on Monday. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. Stand by. Let me disconnect this call. All right. Let's keep going. How's everybody doing? Uh, I want to get to this uh, segment here dealing with Megger Evers, who went longer than I thought. I wanted to in the other segment uh, with Juneteenth. We'll talk. Uh, we'll talk about Juneteenth on Monday show. I may be able to squeeze a little bit um, about Juneteenth in here, but um, the information dealing with critical race theory is really important. That ties into history. The information dealing with um, what's taking place with African American farmers and how this is being attacked. So everybody's saying we want reparations. We want reparations. That's a legislative process. Okay. Most people that say we want reparations can't tell you realistically, logically, how to actually get it. That's a legislative process. It takes 218 votes to get any bill passed in uh, the House of Representatives. All right. Uh, if you go to govtrack.us or congress.gov and look and see how, how much support H.R. 40 has, they're about 188, between 183 to 188 uh, members of Congress that have signed on to support H.R. 40 to actually vote for it. None of them are Republicans. None of them, none of them are Republicans. Republicans don't support reparations, including the two black ones in the House of Representatives, uh, Burgess Owens of Utah and the other dumbass of uh, Bradford, uh, the one is crying, uh, Bronsford, the one is crying uh, because the Congressional Black Caucus won't accept him as a member. Well, you voted not to certify the uh, uh, December 14th, you voted not to certify the votes for the presidential election that were certified by 50 state legislatures. You were one of the 147 traitors that voted to overturn the election results, not to not to certify the election results. So, of course, they're not going to uh, accept you. Um, so I want to go to this clip. So it takes 218 votes. You got about 188. And that's and, and, and you don't have enough votes now to pass HR 40. They're they're still building support. It just passed out of the it just passed out of the uh, House Judiciary Committee a few weeks ago, and that's the first time in 32 years that HR 40 has passed out of the House Judiciary Committee. You have no Republicans in the U.S. Senate that support HR 40. Not even Tim Scott, the only Black Republican in the U.S. Senate. You, you, you don't have enough uh, Democrats to uh, get it passed. Now, you need 60 votes in the Senate. If all, all 50 Democrats po in the Senate vote for H.R. 40, that means you need 10 Republicans that are going to vote for it. Who are the 10 Republicans that are going to vote for H.R. 40? They wouldn't even vote for the American Rescue Plan. They help white Republicans that put them in office. They wouldn't even vote for that. That's why a lot of this is rhetoric. When you go through and actually do a systems, uh, systems analysis and analyzing, now explain to me how you get what it is you say you want. Most of them can't even tell you this. They can't even they, name me 10 Republicans in the Senate that will vote for reparations. They wouldn't even vote for the American Rescue Plan. So what we have to understand is that we have to each election cycle, we have to build upon what we did the previous election cycle. We have to vote more people out of office that keep voting against bills that we're for and vote more people into office that support and will vote for bills that we're for. It's a numbers game. People don't understand the math. It's a numbers game. You, you need 218 votes, a simple majority in the House of Representatives to get any bill passed. If you can't get a bill passed to study reparations, explain to me how you get one passed to pay reparations. The $4 billion in loan forgiveness is being attacked for, for African-American farmers and Hispanic farmers and Asian farmers. A lot of that is going to help African-American farmers. There have been 17,000 farmers that have signed on to get this loan forgiveness. So what this means is if you had a, uh, you had a loan out through like the federal government or something like that, they're going to wipe out this, this debt. That's going to help thousands of African-American farmers who are drowning. John Boyd just talked about this. 
So if a loan forgiveness program is being attacked like this by conservatives, what do you think is going to happen when you start talking about actually paying reparations? Or whatever form reparations is going to be in that you can actually get passed. This is why I, I've said before, we got to think this whole thing through and you got to structure your reparations argument to withstand a legal challenge because this is going to be challenging court. I knew this was going to be challenging court. I already knew this. I knew this was going to be challenging court. And what it seems like a lot of people don't understand is that the judicial branch of government is a co-equal branch of government. You have a legislative branch, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. You have the executive branch, the president, the White House. Then the legislative, then, then the, ex, the, the judicial branch, the courts. The courts are a co-equal branch of government. The courts can strike down a law and, 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 and rule that a law is unconstitutional, therefore illegal. Or the courts can uphold a law and rule that a law is constitutional, therefore elite, therefore legal. The other thing is executive orders from a president can be challenged in court and can be overturned in court. So that's why any reparations argument has to be legally sound because it's going to be challenged. White conservatives are going to challenge this. And what you don't want to happen is that it gets struck down in, in court. This is why I said one of the uh, two main arguments for reparations, legal arguments, one, based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution, because the U.S. Congress outlawed the international transatlantic slave trade March 2nd, 1807. And that's part of that's part of the U.S. Constitution. They put a 20 year clause in the U.S. Constitution, Article one, Section nine, Clause one, that the, that the earliest that the international transatlantic slave trade could be banned would be 1808. And that means bringing Africans in this, into this country to enslave them. The international transatlantic slave trade. U.S. Congress passed a law March 2nd, 1807, to ban the international transatlantic slave trade. It went into effect January 1st, 1808, which means all of those Africans that were brought to this country from January 1st, 1808, up until June of 1860, when the Clotilda came into Alabama, the last known slave ship, all of that was illegal based upon federal law. Their court cases of white men who got caught trafficking, bringing Africans into this country, and they were prosecuted. It was illegal based upon federal law. So, so right there is a foundation for a legal argument for reparation because you're violating federal law and their court cases to back this up. One of the most powerful court cases is the Amistad slave ship case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. If you go to if you go to um, LOC.gov, Library of Congress website, if you go to LOC.gov and research uh, the Amistad, they have some of the original court documents there. When you research the Amistad case at LOC.gov, the Amistad mutiny, Amistad mutiny, they tell you that the uh, it was illegal for those Africans to be captured in the first place because they say it violated uh, existing treaties at the time between the various uh, nations. OK, it, it violated existing treaties at the time. Uh, LOC.gov is what I want. Or is that arch let me see archive let me see is it archives no it's archives.gov this one you can go to llc.gov but i want what's that archives.gov national archives on the amistad slave ship this is a u.s supreme court case this is dealing with law this is a foundation for a legal argument for uh for, for reparations but you gotta understand law to understand this if you go here, archives.gov, National Archives, the Amistad case. I've done an entire presentation dealing with this. In February 1839, Portuguese slave hunters abducted a large group of Africans from Sierra Leone and shipped them to Havana, Cuba, a center for the slave trade. This abduction, read this, this abduction violated all of the treaties then in existence. Treaties are done between nations. This abduction of these Africans was from Ill, illegal from the start because it, it violated all of the existing treaties between these different nations. Two Spanish plantation owners, Pedro Montes and Jose Ruiz, purchased 53 Africans and put them on board and put them aboard the Cuban schooner called the Amistad to ship them to a Caribbean plantation. 
On July 8, 1839, the Africans seized the ship, killed the captain and the cook and, and, and ordered Montez and Ruiz to sail to uh, Africa. OK, now they have some of the original court documents here. If you go research this case, this case goes all to all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. OK. Um, and John Quincy Adams, former president, uh, is, is, uh, is a defense attorney for them. OK, John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams. When you look at the, make a long story short here. You read read all this yourself. Make a long story short. The Supreme Court ruled on behalf of the Africans on the ship. So if you saw the movie Amistad, okay, if you saw the movie Amistad, and um, there is an excellent book about the movie. This book here, Mutiny on the Amistad by Howard Jones. Mutiny on the Amistad by Howard Jones, the events that inspired the major motion picture. OK, this is one of the best books dealing with the history of the Amistad mutiny and the and the court case. What happened to those Africans? All right. So. Um, let me back up here. All right. When you when you look at this case here, you're going to see that. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was illegal for those Africans to be captured in the first place because it violated uh, existing treaties. And then the Supreme Court decided in favor of the Africans. So in the movie Amistad, we see Joseph Sinkyu, OK, and uh, Damar Hansu, Joseph Sinkyu. And you, you see him say, give us free, give us free, things like that. All right. And when I ask people, OK, what happened to those Africans? Uh, on the uh, Amistad slave ship. All right. They say, uh, you know, they were set free. Why were they set free? Okay. Hold on. What is this? Doing? Why were they set free? They, they, they won their, they won their case in the U S Supreme court because it was illegal for them to be captured in the first place. All right. Let me scroll down here. But this is, but this is dealing with law. So when we talk about reparations, Repairing the damage, reparations, number one, we need a comprehensive reparations plan. Just cutting the check ain't going to do it, okay? Because you're dealing with a people largely been taught to hate themselves, been stripped of their history, culture, language, spiritual systems, family ties, all that stuff. So every year we go to conferences and we talk about how African-Americans spend 97% of their dollars with people that don't look like us. If, we, if, if reparations is just in the form of cash payments, what do you think we're going to do with the money? If we all got a half a million dollars a day, white people will have it all back by this time next week. So repairing the damage has to be comprehensive. Cash payments can be part of an overall reparations package. Ain't knowing the hell uh, reparations to be 100% in the form of, of cash payments. White people are going to have this all back this time next week. The only thing you would have done is stimulated their econ economy and the laws and policies will still be in place that maldistributed the wealth power resources in the first place and created the structural inequities that caused the harm. The laws and policies will still be in place. But the Supreme Court decided in favor of the Africans of the Amistad of the Amistad slave ship. Stating they were free individuals kidnapped and transported illegally. They had never been slaves. This is what the U.S. Supreme Court ruled. They had never been slaves. Senior Justice Joseph Story wrote and read the decision, quote, it was the ultimate right of all human beings in extreme cases to resist oppression and to apply force against a ruinous injustice. End quote. The opinion asserted that the Africans right to resist, quote unquote, unlawful slavery. They, they, so they said the Africans had a right to take up arms on that slave ship and, and, the, and, and, and fight for their freedom because that's what they did. All right. So read this. This deals with the Amistad slave ship case. This is a U.S. Supreme Court case of 1841. This is at uh, archives.gov, the, the National Archives, archives.gov, okay? And then also the uh, Black, Freedman, Black Freedman Indian Treaties of 1866, that lays a legal foundation for slavery as well, because those are laws still on the books right now. And those Africans who were enslaved by the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians, they got some type of reparations. And those are laws that are still on the books right now. They got some type of reparations. All right. So I want to go to this clip here. This is dealing with uh, Megar Evers. Uh, so Megar Evers was uh, assassinated June 12th. 
1963. And he was assassinated by uh, Byron uh, Della Beckwith, okay, who was a member of the um, White Citizens Council there in, in Mississippi. And oftentimes when we talk about civil rights leaders, um, oftentimes when we talk about civil rights leaders, uh, Megger Evers gets left out of the conversation for some reason, okay? Now, maybe he was, uh, I don't know. Now, he was only 37 when he was assassinated, okay? 